everyone, my name is Evie Lupine. Welcome back to my channel. And today I have another video for you all. Today I want to go into a little bit more of a serious topic than some of the videos that we've done in the last couple of weeks. Frankly, I think I've kind of been saving up my spoons to talk about it. And that is the issue of people blaming not using a safe word as an excuse for when consent violation or abuse happens in BDSM situations. Now, if you have been involved in the online community for any length of time, if you're on FetLife, if you follow people on Instagram, particularly people who talk about or post pictures of rope bondage, you no doubt have heard of or seen the dozens, if not hundreds, of consent violation issues that have popped up over the last couple of years in public kink spaces. And I just wanna kinda of start out this conversation by recognizing that the majority of these situations that come out in public are situations where the person whose consent is being violated or whose consent is being injured in some way is typically somebody who identifies as a bottom or as a submissive, is somewhere on that side of the slash or is somebody who is a switch and acting out that particular side of themselves when the incident occurs. This is not to say that these are the only people who have issues, people who have all different types of roles in BDSM, people who are dominants and masters and tops, people who are switches and littles and pets, it all applies. Consent violation issues can happen to anyone in any relationship style. This is by no means an exclusive thing to people who are submissives or bottoms. But at the same time, I myself am a bottom, I am a submissive, I identify with that portion of the identity of the BDSM world, and I can only really speak to my experience because what I want to focus on here is why it doesn't work to blame issues on while well, they never used a safe word. Because they think there are certain things that are part of the submissive and bottom experience, particularly in the public BDSM world, that make it more difficult for people to feel comfortable using that, particularly in situations where it is most needed. But before I get into that, let's talk a little bit more about safe words in general. When I talk about safe words in this video specifically, I am talking about the use of either a red or a term like red. The hard stop, this is wrong, this is something that we didn't negotiate, I need the scene to end now type of safe word. Not just green, not just yellow, or any of the other colors or systems that you might use for a safe word as part of a BDSM scene. And People talk about safe words like in this package when we introduce BDSM of like your safety kit, right? Like, oh, if you negotiate, if you play in public, if you have a safe word, you know, you're gonna be fine, you're gonna be safe. And I think that can lead to kind of the misunderstanding that like as long as you have those in place, you're always gonna be okay. When the reality is a safe word is only as good as the person who decides to respect that safe word. I usually think about safe words, and particularly red, as like a fire alarm. It's a tool that can indicate that something is wrong in the scene and that that scene needs to end. In the same way that a fire alarm alerts you that a fire is probably happening somewhere in the building or the house that you're in where the fire alarm is going off. That doesn't mean that there are no other signs that something is happening. You know, if you ignore a safe word and you go, oh, well, you know, they never used a safe word, so how was I supposed to know that something was wrong? It'd be like ignoring a fire alarm as though there weren't any other signs that a fire was happening, like the door being really hot, or there being the sound of a crackling fire, or the room becoming filled with smoke. If you ignore all those signs and go, well, the fire alarm's not going off, so everything must be okay, that would be pretty stupid. Now, this is not to say that everything that occurs within the context of a safe word not being heard and then immediately responded to is always the exact same situation, but if we were looking at a situation 
for the most part, it's not just entirely ambiguous. For the most part, there is some kind of indication that something might be going wrong. That could be somebody going completely nonverbal or somebody, you know, becoming dissociated or somebody like suddenly having any kind of like drastic change in behavior. My personal philosophy is when I engage in BDSM play, my expectation is if there's any kind of sudden drastic change in behavior, be that going from like, yelling and screaming to being really quiet or being really quiet and suddenly yelling and screaming to stop, stop, no, no, everything is wrong, this isn't working, you know, if there's any kind of drastic change, you probably want to check in because safe words are just a tool that lets you know really succinctly and hopefully unambiguously that something is going wrong. But you should also usually be able to rely on like, you know, indications maybe non-verbally that something maybe isn't processing super well or body language or there's a million other things like you should just be able to like also not only go like, oh, well, you know, I didn't hear a safe word and it doesn't matter that they're telling me, no, 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 stop, stop, stop. I don't even need to check in. I haven't heard a safe word yet. So why would I even bother? Now, there are people who have negotiated a blanket consent CNC type of dynamic that occurs throughout the duration of the relationship where maybe that kind of behavior is expected, where maybe it would be considered okay to just ignore, you know, no, 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 stop, stop, stop. That happens for hours and hours on end and people trying to bite themselves out of their own restraints. But usually for like an average scene that you've negotiated in a dungeon, it's probably best if you're not sure that consent is still happening that you check in because consent is an ongoing process. Consent doesn't just like end and begin when you negotiate for a scene. It's something that can change over time throughout the course of something happening. Consent can always be revoked. But what I want to talk about is why I think that you can't always just rely on safe words and why they're not necessarily a perfect system. Because if we lived in a perfect world, maybe we could rely just on safe words. But I think particularly, again, for people who are on the bottom slash submissive side of things, it can be a lot more difficult to feel empowered to use safe words for a wide variety of reasons. So the first thing that I see a lot of is that we place safe words on a pedestal. It is seen as your like last resort. If everything else hasn't worked, you have to use your safe word. And it can be really shameful really guilt inducing to have to use a safe word because a lot of people think about it as like, oh, if I'm using a safe word, I'm ruining the scene. My partner's having a good time, so I don't want them to have to stop what they're doing. Or you're playing in public and you have to deal with the public stigma of having DMs come in and intervene in your scene, or people hearing or seeing that you can't take something anymore, or people making assumptions about the type of play that you're engaging in, or thinking that maybe you're not submissive enough, you're not enough of a pain slot to really be able to, you know, endure what's happening to you and you're you're weak, or you don't really know what you want, or you know, you and your partner are in a bad relationship. When in reality, like safe words don't always just have to mean that like the scene is going terribly or your consent's being violated. You know, maybe you need to use a safe word because your allergies are flaring up and maybe you feel like you're choking behind that gag. Or maybe your contact lenses are really bothering you and you just need to be able to get them out of your eyes and you can't stand it anymore because your eyes are so dry. Or maybe your foot's falling asleep. You know, people don't feel empowered to communicate during the course of a scene for things that are too minor. It's like, oh, well, I don't want a safe word right now. You know, I don't even maybe want to even use a yellow because I don't want to interrupt the flow of the scene. So I'm just going to sit and huddle inside of myself and endure it and just hope that it gets better. And so through the process of doing that, it can often happen that like multiple issues within a scene compound that maybe we are all really minor taken individually, but together create a situation where a bottom probably should say red because it would be in their own best interest. It would be their own sense of self-preservation that would necessitate that they end the scene. But because of all that built up shame and potential guilt and not wanting to be judged by others, you know, it ends up they don't say anything. They just kind of stick with it, even if it's a really, really sucky situation. A related issue to this is number two, which is competitiveness. I personally really, really struggle with processing this in a positive way. I think in the public community especially, D-types tend to talk about submissives in 
frankly, very competitive ways. I know a lot of people who brag about how much pain their partner can take. I know a lot of people who like to show off in their scenes about how much pain they can take or how much pain their partner is able to give them before they break. And I, I think, you know, it's not necessarily a bad thing that people are proud of how much they can do in BDSM, of what their tolerance level is, but this can create a situation where people feel pressured to continue consenting to pain that is no longer good for them or pain that they're no longer able to process or engage in scenes that they don't even really like just for the sake of being able to keep up with the other people around them. Like, for example, maybe you have a friend or you have somebody in the scene that you know that like really, really loves caning and they do caning on their butt until they bleed. And you want to be able to do that same kind of scene too. So you get really, really competitive with that and you engage in a scene that one, involves a kind of play that you don't really like to begin with and goes to a level of pain that maybe you're not super comfortable with. And then also kind of results in a situation where you're just not really like engaging in what I would consider like overall super healthy reasons for engaging in a certain BDXM activity. If you are doing things just to be competitive and if you're forcing yourself to endure something simply because you don't want other people to think that you're like a baby or a wuss or a newbie or something or that you don't really know what kinds of scenes that you like or for whatever other thing that all the stupid competition creates like I don't think that creates an environment where people feel encouraged and safe to use their safe words because it creates a situation where it's like oh my reputation is going to be damaged if I use this and that leads me to number three which is fear of disappointment and abandonment along with the general competitive nature that a lot of people in BDSM seem to have with each other that can create a fear that somebody's not going to want to play with you anymore. The fear that maybe a partner will break up with you if you can't engage in this type of play that they really want you to be able to do. It can create a sense of like, oh, well, like this is my only opportunity to do this with this one person. And if I back out now, they're not going to be impressed with me. They're not going to ever want to see with me ever again. And they're going to think I'm a baby and a wuss. And then I'm not really into BDSM and I just need to be able to prove myself. And that creates a situation where out of fear of being out of play partners, out of fear of not being able to engage in a certain kind of play, out of not wanting people to leave them, people will avoid using safe words because they're like, oh, if I do this, you know, this person isn't going to like me anymore, or they're going to think that we're not compatible, or I know this is really important to my partner, so if I can't do this, they're going to find somebody else. And it, there's just so much potential worry and fear that's baked into that, that it can make it very difficult, again, for people to feel comfortable using safe words. If you're so worried about doing something, you know, that your partner really, really enjoys that maybe you don't to the point where you like don't write out of a scene, that does not create a super great situation for a lot of people. And it can create, you know, scenarios where over time somebody ends up doing something over and over and over again that they're not comfortable with simply because they're afraid their partner might leave them if they don't, or that their play partner isn't going to want to play with them anymore, or that they're going to lose friends, or that they aren't going to be taken seriously. Again, there's all of the social pressure that goes into not using safe words. Number four, kind of changing themes a little bit here, is altered states of consciousness. This is a really, really big one and one that I don't think we talk about enough. So a lot of us know about subspace, a lot of us know about dom space, top space, etc. Basically, when you engage in BDSM activities, there's always the possibility that as a result in the chemicals in your brain changing around, you can go to a place where you feel really drunk or high or not fully in control of your body or not able to communicate or going mute or not having access to all of your typical faculties or any of a number of other potential changes. And what all of this does is it means that you are in an altered state of consciousness. And when you are not necessarily fully in touch with reality in the same way that like normal everyday you might be, this can create situations where either you are engaging in activities that maybe long-term non-high you wouldn't really want you to do, 
or in current situations that because you can't maybe fully access language or remember how to control certain body parts or you know not remember what your safe word is or not recognize the person you're playing with anymore you know you might not use your safe word because of that and I know from stories I've heard in, in my own community when I've gone to classes that sometimes when people go into subspace when they go into a really deep headspace they think that they've said safe words that nobody else has heard they have imagined in their head over and over again in their minds they're saying red 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 but then nothing actually comes out of their mouth and because this happens we can't rely on safe words alone by themselves to indicate whether or not a scene is actually going badly because in subspace especially that can be a really good thing uh it can be a situation where maybe it's really good at first and it becomes bad for any number of reasons psychological physical things inside the scene or outside of the scene bringing up past memories etc etc but because people can sometimes become locked in their own subspace and unable to communicate that can produce uh, undesirable results that if we could always be in full complete control of ourselves wouldn't necessarily always happen all right another one here is that we don't practice safe words for me this is a really really big thing i to continue the fire analogy it's sort of like having a fire or an emergency escape plan that you never practice sure it's really great to have a poster on a wall that tells you oh when there's a fire you know take this exact exit and take out this route and we're all gonna meet in this one area in a field well if you never practice it when there is actually an emergency when you're in a heightened state when you are really anxious or worried or frenzied or any sort of other you know altered heightened state of mind are you going to remember everything that that poster on the wall says or are you simply going to run and try and jump out of the window and do anything you can to get out of that situation now this is not always to say that people who are confronted with sudden intense experiences that are negative in BDSM suddenly just act wild and crazy and aren't able to control themselves and forget their safe words but that does sometimes happen it does sometimes happen that when you are suddenly in a situation where something is happening that you're not okay with or you reach a mental or physical wall that you can't get past that is negative for you that you're no longer processing in a good way it can be that you simply forget your safe word. You go, oh, frick, what's that word that we agreed on? Oh, my God, what is it? I can't remember. I can't remember. It's on the tip of my tongue, but I can't say it. And then you panic because you can't remember. And then the panic takes over your brain, and so you really, really can't remember because all you're thinking about is the panic. And so I think in order to really be able to rely more on safe words as a functional safety net, we need to actually be able to practice using them so our brains are creating connections that make them easier to access in places where we are maybe in heightened emotional states or in heightened mental or, or physical states. So this could mean maybe that we practice using safe words in a scene where maybe we set up something where it's like, I have a timer set up and two minutes into the scene when that timer goes off I need you to say red or maybe you perhaps negotiate for a situation where you know you specifically play to red where it's like I'm going to do something in this scene that I know that you're not going to be okay with I'm gonna lick the bottom of your feet and then I'm gonna scrub the bottom of your feet with toothpaste and when that happens I want you to say red and just have practice using whatever that safe word is in a scene context and also maybe even just as a bottom as a submissive practice saying it to yourself in the mirror practice actually saying the word red as loudly as you can at yourself in the shower in the mirror just so you can kind of get that feeling in your mouth and then also knowing that it's going to be okay after you say it because you've had practice saying it and you know that like oh when i say this you know the ceiling doesn't fall down it's not the end of the world it's just a word uh, the last one here I would consider to be the most insidious or the most dangerous and I would call this the daddy knows best phenomena. This is particularly prevalent with people who are newer to the scene or people who play online or have long distance relationships and this would be the fact that sometimes tops and dominants think that they know the bodies and limits of their partners more than their partners do so what happens is maybe somebody gets to a point where they use a safe word or they're about to use a safe word and the partner goes oh no 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 
you're doing fine. You can keep doing this. We don't need to stop the scene. I know what's best for you. I'm going to keep going. We're going to keep going through this activity that you've already said you don't want to participate in anymore because I think that you need to increase your tolerance, get more practice. I think that you're being a crybaby. I think that you really don't even know what your own limits are. Or maybe it's like, oh, this isn't a big deal. You, for some reason, that's totally weird to me, sarcasm, have this weird limit around blindfolds. And I don't think that blindfolds are a big deal. So when I put a blindfold on you, I want you to be able to just sit and take it. Or even worse, retroactively, after a scene has already ended, because somebody's safe word, going back and gaslighting them and telling them that the situation went completely differently. Or telling them that something that, you know, the negotiated explicitly was a limit, wasn't really negotiated, or that something that was a limit really wasn't. And it can get really, really confusing and really toxic really fast. But even in anomalous situations where a dominant struts in and goes, oh, well, I've been doing this for 20 years and I've never had a partner who's had a problem with this before. You know, it's just, it's, it's, it just puts a really bad taste in my mouth. You know, I think if we're going to engage in informed consensual BDSM relationships, we have to believe our partners when they tell us what's going on in their bodies and what's going on in their minds and where they have triggers or what upsets them. And if we can't take those things seriously, maybe they aren't the right partner for us. Maybe this isn't something where the energy is compatible. Because if you for some reason can't believe that your partner has, you know, a hard limit around green polo shirts and you're like, oh, well, that means that like, I'm just going to wear green polos around them because that's silly and ridiculous and funny. Like, why? Why do you do this? Listen to your partners. Believe them when they say that something is a limit or making them uncomfortable and believe them when they use safe words and stop judging them for doing it. Stop trying to convince people that doms are mind readers and suddenly no submissives more than submissives know themselves because that is a fantasy. That is a fairy tale. Dominants are not mind readers. They are not all knowing. They are not all seeing. And the fact that people would potentially use that as an excuse to ignore a safe word or to keep pushing boundaries when they've been told not to is just insane to me. And even more than that, again, this can go beyond just like malicious, purposeful use, but it can be very difficult to use safe words with somebody who has inherent systematic power over you in some way. It, it's not necessarily this is something where people ignore safe words, rather it becomes a lot more difficult to feel empowered to use them if they have a really big reputation in a local scene, if they're a famous person, if they're older and more experienced, if they're extremely attractive to you, if you are in a long-term DS relationship that you're really invested in, you know, if they, you know, are, are somehow otherwise, like maybe they're way more financially successful than you. Maybe you're playing in their house and you feel scared or you feel obligated to keep playing with them after you've negotiated for something. There are so many factors that can happen in terms of a personal, you know, one-on-one -on -one interaction that can make it feel more difficult to have people feel okay using safe words simply because of the nature of where people are at, you know, socioeconomically compared to each other in terms of scene reputation. And this happens so much with rope bondage, especially. You have so many situations where, you know, somebody negotiates a scene with a really famous person that really famous person uses their fame to get close to new and vulnerable people who they then like, renegotiate with slash like don't explicitly negotiate with again like mid-scene to do extra things with that they assume were okay because they never said no and it turns out the only reason that the bottom went along with doing that was because they were really big and powerful and famous and they didn't want to upset, upset them or they thought that was just how things were and it's just it's so toxic and yeah I think that's all I really have the energy in me to talk about today. I'm sure there are dozens, hundreds maybe of even other reasons why safe words can be difficult to use. And overall, what I really wanna get across in this video is just an examination of why we can't necessarily purely rely on safe words on their own as a perfect system for establishing and evaluating consent in the scene in BDSM. They are amazing tools. Safe words are great. I personally, you know, would not feel comfortable playing without them. I don't recommend that people play without them, you know, in general. 
but that doesn't mean that they always work as intended. It doesn't mean that they're always perfect. And I don't think we should be using this excuse of, oh, well, they never safe worded as like a fail safe for like getting away with consent violations and scene. Like this is a street that goes both ways. Consent goes both ways. And just because somebody hasn't used a safe word doesn't mean that you have a get out of jail free card because of all the reasons that I've listed and more that can make it really difficult for people to feel empowered to use them. So overall, if you take anything away from this video, I would want you to understand that safe words aren't perfect, that we should practice using them more, that we should freaking normalize using safe words. That is what I want people to do in this video. You know, I'm not necessarily encouraging people to get into situations where they need to use them, but have more conversations about using safe words. Make it a normal topic. Don't stigmatize it. Don't shame people who have to use them. Don't villainize people that have to use them. It is okay. It is a communication tool. And if we can't treat a communication tool as a normal, healthy part of a BDSM dynamic or relationship, you know, how can we ever expect people to use them if all they're going to get is, is shame and fear and guilt for using it? Anyways, that's all I really have for today's video. Hopefully this made some sense. Hopefully something in this, you know, made sense to you. Again, you know, I, I don't want to blame anybody on any particular side of any theoretical or real situation about, you know, who's responsible for something happening. But I do just want people to understand that safe words are not entirely perfect. Anyways, I feel like I've ranted about this entirely too much. If you enjoyed this video, if you have any other comments or questions, please feel free to leave that down in the comment section below. If you enjoyed this video, if you want to know more about BDSM, please do subscribe. If you haven't already, I make videos twice a week. And finally, if you really enjoy this content, if you want to support the work that I do here on this channel, the best place you can do that is over on Patreon. I have access to exclusive videos and extra posts and one-on-one -on -one chats, all sorts of great things. So if you haven't already, please do check that out. Links will be down in the description box below. If you do already support me on there, thank you so, so much. It means the absolute world to me. And until I see you guys next time, I hope you have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week. Bye-bye.